Welcome and thank you all for joining us for this video accompaniment to the Bali 101 Toolkit, which is Bali's compilation of resources for localists looking to catalyze local economy action in their communities. The full toolkit is located at the Bali website, www.bealocalist.org, and has a comprehensive collection of materials and resources to help you start and advance your work. Business incubators, business accelerators, and co-working spaces are the local economy ecosystem model that this video will be exploring. And we are fortunate to have Davida Davison, co-director of Food Lab Detroit, as our moderator for this conversation. Davida, take it away. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm really happy um, to be here. And what I want to do is I want to um, introduce um, Food Lab Detroit, where I serve as co-director. So, Andrew, if you would not mind, if you could bring up the Food Lab slide, that would be great. And after I introduce Food Lab, we're going to have also joining me are my esteemed colleagues, um, Donovan. And Donovan is the director of Radius Ventures. And we have Kelly, who's the CEO of SE Greenhouse, Social Enterprise Greenhouse. But a little bit about Food Lab Detroit. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization located in the city of Detroit. And we are a community of over 150 locally owned good food businesses who are committed to transforming Detroit's local food economy. And the great thing about our organization is that we design the systems that our entrepreneurs need. We create the networks that our entrepreneurs so desire, and we create the system so that we can grow a diverse ecosystem of triple bottom line businesses. And when I say diverse, one of the things that I'm super proud about is Food Lab is an organization that has 150 locally owned good food businesses. And those good food businesses range from restaurateurs to food businesses that create an added value product that you'll find on your local grocery store shelves. Um, we have food trucks. We also have uh, caterers and distributors. But the really neat thing about being in the city of Detroit and our diverse ecosystem is that 74% of our businesses are owned by women. And out of that 74%, 62% are women of color, and we are super um, really proud of that. And we all come together because our mission is to really help to create this new economy that's equitable, sustainable, and prosperous for all. And how do we do that? What does our ecosystem of support look like? So these are some of the services um, that we provide at Food Lab Detroit. Andrew, the next slide, please. And so we really wrap around our um, ecosystem of support. Go back one more, Andrew. We really wrap around our ecosystem of support, which is based upon our theory of change. And that theory of change model is what we call the three C's. It's called cultivate, connect, and catalyze. Because we believe that we need to cultivate um, our members, and that's providing our individual entrepreneurs technical assistance, workshops, and we do collaborative learning. So we do a 12-week base boot camp on how to build a good food business along with add-on advanced level workshops. We do eight of those a year. We have office hours um, that we provide for our members as well. And after we cultivate those members and we give them all of the opportunities to learn from experts in the field and also each other, we believe in the power of connection. And we connect our entrepreneurs to each other, to resources, key individuals across sectors. We work with over 25 partners because we believe the, the power of peer-to-peer -peer networking and connecting members to each other. We use a very robust listserv um, to connect our members, and we have all kinds of fun kind of member-only events. And then after we cultivate our members and provide them the learning opportunities, connect them to each other and the resources, one of the things that our, we do is we catalyze, and that is what we believe at Food Lab is that in order to make changes in the local food economy, no one individual business can make those changes alone. So it's really important that we work together as a network to make a change in the local food economy. So we catalyze change, and that means that we work on big picture projects once a year to drive a more resilient local food economy. So we do the business boot camp. We provide technical workshops, as I indicated. We also provide catering referrals for our members. We connect them to capital, and we also tell their story through our website and also through our newsletter. And we do this in the last slide, Andrew, please. And we do this in service 
of creating an ecosystem um, in Detroit because we know that you can create a business. That business can be part of a larger economy where you can create a business that's based on collaboration, human well-being, respect for the planet. And we know that our members are a part of our organization and they come together around a solid, a solid goal. And that is, it does not matter where you are in the city of Detroit, one's ethnicity, one zip code should not determine one's ability to have access to fresh, healthy food, safe streets in their community, and then the ability to find quality jobs. So that's who we are, Food Lab Detroit. Donovan, take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a very inspirational organization, and uh, it's, it's going to be tricky to follow. Uh, but I'll give it a shot. So I'm, I'm Donovan Willard, and I am the Director of Ventures at, uh, at, at Radius. Uh, which is a social innovation hub and venture incubator uh, in Vancouver, Canada at Simon Fraser University. And uh, next slide, please. So essentially what RADIUS sets out to be uh, is to be a place for radical doers. And by radical doers, we mean all of those people that are completely driven uh, by a passion and a commitment to innovation. And, and they want to bring their whole self to transforming the economic landscape around them towards greater social justice, environmental justice, uh, and climate change and ecosystem health, uh, or climate and ecosystem health, I should say. And so the way that we approach this is by uh, bringing together communities of practice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and these communities of practice are uh, peer-based environments that pick up in an undergrad classroom uh, at SFU uh, and go right through to entrepreneurs that are getting ready for you know their first rounds of, of outside capital or venture capital. And so in every case we work from a, a, a basic assumption that by bringing uh, people together, uh, they're initially individuals uh, and working on them as people to help them understand the role that they will play uh, in a leadership environment, really understand their true passions, really understand their true uh, skills and, uh, and inclinations, and by nesting them uh, with a bunch of like-minded people that are driven by the same things, are struggling with the same things, uh, and are also uh, focused on similar outcomes, uh, that's where we get the transformative change that we like to see. So if we could go to the next uh, slide, maybe in just kind of quick succession. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, the goal of our work is uh, to recognize that uh, we are a place for doers, but most of our doing uh, is, is through cultivating uh, and helping the people that we work with get on their path. Uh, and so for us, it's all about the Delta R, uh, you know, the change in trajectory from the time that they start with Radius uh, to the place that they get to coming out. Uh, and we have, you know, we measure this in terms of their level of, of connectivity and integration into you know, the Vancouver uh, impact scene and beyond. Uh, we do this in terms of, you know, tracking their revenue revenue in the case of entrepreneurs. Um, or we track this in the, in the form of, you know, funds raised and the amount of impact uh, that their products and services have as they're getting them out into the world uh, and shaping it uh, in a positive direction. So next slide. Uh, so here again, and we could probably actually go like one, two, three on these slides here. Uh, but essentially our approach is to take, um, you know, start with a person, personal transformation uh, and, and passion identification, skills development, to really, you know, shape these people as leaders as they go out uh, in, in, into their journey ahead, and then nest them in a peer community. Uh, and here again is the community of practice that we work with. Uh, and these are the folks uh, that are going to be there to, again, celebrate the wins and, you know, agonize over the, you know, God, I don't know what accounting is kind of questions. Uh, and then nest that peer community into the broader ecosystem of existing entrepreneurs, uh, support organizations, investors, what have you. And from all of these three levels of, of engagement, uh, we ultimately get uh, on the next slide, please. You know the you know the broader transformation that we're hoping to achieve. Uh, and so that that transformation is again you know the higher social justice, higher environmental justice, uh, and climate change uh, avoidance and ecosystem well-being. Um, next slide. 
So in addition to our cohort-based programs, uh, we do a number of events in the community. Uh, one of our signature events, uh, which is, is really key, is, is essentially destigmatizing uh, the effort of, of taking a, a risk and putting yourself out there to be a force of, of positive change, and that's our, our Social Venture Failure Wake, uh, which is an annual event, and, and it's, a, it's modeled on an Irish wake. Uh, so it's in a bar, uh, and it's a bunch of people that are getting together. We hear from you know, four or five uh, different entrepreneurs that have put their heart and soul into something and ultimately had it run out of the rocks. Uh, and you know, it's a safe environment. It's a fun environment. We give a toast at the end. Um, and really the spirit of it is, you know, that, that the failure of a particular venture is not the failure of an entrepreneur. Um, you know, the failure of an entrepreneur is not getting in there trying to do it in the first place. Or to muddle along in a zombie company that's not going to be, uh, you know, living up to the potential that it was hoped to have in the first place. So it's really about releasing that entrepreneurial energy back into the community, and uh, yeah, and hopefully, you know, getting a lot more ventures created in, at the outset. Um, I do have a few other example slides, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I, we can draw on those uh, as we get into the conversation. Uh, so why don't I end it there, and then we can head it back to. Uh, to Davida to introduce Kelly. Great. And then uh, lastly, um, I would love to introduce um, Kelly Ramirez, uh, who is the CEO of SC Greenhouse, Social Enterprise Greenhouse, um, another organization that I absolutely love. So yeah, Kelly, you want to take it away? <laughs> Thank you, Davida. And um, thank you so much to Bali for this opportunity. And uh, it's great to be alongside uh, amazing colleagues like Donovan and, and Davida. Um, so let's just, just jump right in. Andrew, if you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, Social Enterprise Greenhouse is a nonprofit network of now 170 business and community leaders who really believe that um, we can drive job creation and community impact through the development of do well, do good businesses, um, social enterprises. And, and I get asked a lot, what is a social enterprise? What is your definition? Um, and we, we actually are pretty big tent um, when we think about what a social enterprise is. So um, we work with nonprofits that have revenue generating businesses, for profits that are creating good jobs and, and making the world a better place. Um, and we really have seen that if we, by being more inclusive, once a business uh, gets involved with our community, the trend is just amazing. They just want to keep doing more and more good. Um, we are a ecosystem builder, so we really believe that um, it takes an ecosystem to help develop these types of uh, businesses, and we now have 250 do well, do good businesses in our portfolio. I should say we are um, based in Providence, Rhode Island. We work statewide. We're dabbling regionally, and we're partnering with some other amazing impact accelerators um, across North America. Um, we can go ahead and advance the slide, Andrew, and it's actually going to take a couple uh, advancements because yeah, we've got that that do well, do good graphic. Um, so this is our theory of action. Um, sorry about all those little dots, but basically we are trying to build the, type, uh, the pipeline of social entrepreneurs and give them what they need to succeed. So we think that's business acumen, helping them attract new markets, helping them tap into the right networks that they need. Um, working with policymakers to ensure that we have a supportive enabling environment and making sure that they get, of course, the capital that they need. And we think if we do those things, we'll end up with more successful, sustainable social enterprises and ultimately um, job creation um, and, you know, a, a better world. Um, let's go ahead and advance the slide. Um, so, again, ecosystem versus accelerator. So we, we have been working for almost uh, seven years now to develop a menu of services that we think are uh, the 
tools and resources that an entrepreneur needs from very early stage, like, hey, I've got this idea, all the way to funding. Um, so we have a bucket of what we call venture development services. That's 101 workshops. That's our very robust um, three-month accelerator program that we offer in collaboration with Brown University. Um, after uh, folks get out of the accelerator, they can come back to us and access post-acceleration strategy support through a huddle. We have entrepreneur forums. Um, we have a co-working space. We have a loan fund. We're working very hard to link our businesses to potential impact investors. So we're in the early stages of thinking through sort of the development of a, of a social impact angel group. Um, and we do all sorts of networking events. So I have to say, like, really our secret sauce, if I think about what, um, what we do really well and um, why I think we've gotten traction is that it really is the community. So uh, it, it's just the business community, the academic community, um, uh, community leaders have all come around uh, together around this concept of, of building do well, do good businesses. Um, let's advance the slide. Uh, the next slide is, is um, a picture of our co-working space. Uh, I guess we'll get into this a little bit later in the conversation. So uh, I'll just say like, woohoo, we opened this in April <laughs> and it's been a game changer and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. And let's advance the slide, Andrew. Um, and the next slide is just a um, purely selfish promotional <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, slide. We do a big two-day national social enterprise conference. Um, it's this year. It's April 29th to 30th at Brown University. Uh, it's a great event. Um, Bali participated last year. I'm, I'm hoping that I can talk Donovan and Davida into participating this year. Um, but it really is a great opportunity to meet um, with some of the leading social entrepreneurs nationally, uh, work with uh, people who are active in our ecosystem. Um, so just wanted to, to do that. And then the last slide. Uh, again, we've we've been you know we've been at this for almost seven years now. Um, I need to update this slide, but really I've, I'm really starting to see some pretty amazing metrics. Um, so we now work with a portfolio of 215 businesses that have created a thousand jobs, and in aggregate are are reaching um, a million uh, a million people. So improving the lives of a million people. Um, and I, I should have said earlier on, we have traditionally worked across industry, and about six months ago, we decided to launch sort of a cluster, uh, cluster approach. So our first uh, cluster focus area is local healthy food. So in addition to our impact accelerator that will run in 2016, we're also running an accelerator for local healthy food businesses. Our second cluster is around health and wellness, and the third is around water, energy, and the environment. And um, by, by sort of identifying these key areas where we think the state has needs and assets, um, we've really been able to expand our community and, and build our pipeline, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Davida. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Donovan. And um, I just want to uh, thank again um, Bali for bringing us all together. And I've got to tell you guys, I'm you know I'm the young one, right? I'm the, I'm the one that's green and wet behind the ears. Kelly, you've been doing this for about seven years. Donovan, how long um, have you been doing this work? How long has uh, Radius been around? Well, there's different answers to those questions, unfortunately. Uh, Radius itself is about two years old. Okay. We just uh, we just launched our third six month uh, uh, accelerator cohort. Right. And I myself, as you can tell, if I'm on camera, are a bit of a grizzled vet, uh, <laughs> gray beard. So uh, so I've been uh, well, I've been I've been in the impact world, uh, you know, starting as as an activist and then as an advocate and then you know working on solutions or focused things and then took the switch into being an entrepreneur about 10 years ago. Right. Uh, and, and from that, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and the reason why I brought that up first and foremost before we start doing getting into the nitty gritty for the next 45 minutes or so is that I really want the audience to, to understand that um, all of us bring um, various different experience to the table and all of our organizations right, are at different stages. And so none of this happened um, overnight. We talked a lot about how important community is, how important the ecosystem is, and I was wondering if we could spend just a few minutes talking about how important and how critical it was for us to develop partnerships and have our own ecosystem built around our organizations in order to start, grow, and even scale our organizations. And so I want to say that for Food Lab Detroit, we actually started as a project under a larger nonprofit organization. And that larger nonprofit organization was DWEJ, which is Detroit Workers for Environmental Justice here in Detroit. We didn't just jump out there and say, oh, you know what, we're going to start a nonprofit organization. That didn't happen. We started as a project um, under a larger nonprofit, and we started with seven people sitting around a kitchen table um, wondering, great, I want to start a food business, but there's no support, there's no resources, there's no community out there that will allow me to do that collaboratively. And then from there, we partnered with Detroit Eastern Market, which again is a larger nonprofit, for-profit um, um, partner here in the city of Detroit. And that's how we started. We started very slow. So Donovan and Kelly, I was wondering if you could just take for a second and identify some partners um, that were really critical in helping um, the organization start and scale. Kel, I know you work with Brown University. Donovan, I saw in your slide that uh, Radius works with, um, what was it? It was... Um, Simon Fraser University. Yeah, exactly. It was Simon Fraser University. Now, I think you guys also work with Van City, which is a credit union as well. So if you guys just spend a couple of minutes kind of identifying some real critical partners. Sure. I, I mean, I can jump in on that. Uh, yeah. So, so Radius is a part of the, uh, you know, ironically, the business school at, B, at the BD School of Business at Simon Fraser University. And I think what SFU recognizes um, is that you know the relationship between universities and community and professional trajectories is changing. You know, mm -hmm. you can put it in, in you know millennial generational kind of language, or just look at the you know whatever you want to call it, most of the jobs that are going to be done in the next five to ten years don't have names for them yet. Exactly. They're going to be invented. They're going to be created. And so it takes a different approach to uh, engaging uh, and training people up. In many cases, that means a much um, a looser and deeper uh, connection between the university uh, and the community that it's looking to serve and recognizing that in entrepreneurship you know, there's all these people that have stars in their eyes that are, you know, just like, I'm going to, I created a school project, uh, and this is now going to be the venture that I create. And in many cases, they're actually right. There's some amazing ideas that come out. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also many, many steps from that point to getting ready to, you know, you know have the full potential. That, yeah. uh, so that's that's where we work. And then Ben City, uh, Ben City Credit Union is, is, Canada's largest credit union has got $20 billion in assets, uh, and it's deeply, deeply committed uh, to a positive social environmental outcome. And so it's an amazing benefit that, you know, all the profits from this uh, financial institution don't go off to wherever their shareholders happen to live and, and pad their already comfortable uh, lifestyles. You know, uh, over a third of that uh, comes straight back into supporting the ecosystem that we're a part of. Another third goes into the foundation, and then the other third goes to the members, which are all members. Wow. Right. So it's a tremendous partner. Exactly. Kel? Yeah, sure. Um, so our model is all about partnerships. Uh, I, I should say we started out as a chapter of Social Venture Partners, um, and about seven years ago, I got involved and in sort of was trying to help the group figure out how to pivot and be more sustainable and, and um, be more relevant, quite honestly, in the community. And um, I was new to Rhode Island at the time, and um, Rhode Island is the smallest state in the nation, and uh, I saw it as just this amazing opportunity to um, uh, work with a number of the academic institutions who, you know, similar to what Donovan was saying, were really realizing that there was all of this momentum in the impact space and they needed to provide opportunities 
um, to their students. Um, so we now partner with all 12 colleges and universities in our state. Um, we have a uh, an ambassador that's an intern with us that um, is placed on the university campus with the goal of really getting the word out to the student population about the opportunities that they can tap into at Social Enterprise Greenhouse, which really, if, you, if they're an entrepreneur, they can access our services. And if they want to get involved in the impact space, we um, link them to our portfolio ventures through a talent concierge service that we have that we launched about, I don't know, four or five months ago, and we've already made 45, I think, internships slash job placements. Um, there's wow. There's so much interest in this, and Brown is really one of our most robust partners, so we do a lot of programming with them. Equally important has been partnerships with um, policymakers, so we partner with the city and state. Um, they are sort of co-hosting this year our seed conference. Um, we're talking to both of them about investing in our loan fund, um, so we'll be doing hopefully some co-investing. Uh, our Secretary of State and Treasurer are both very interested in creating um, legislation to make benefit corporation uh, incorporation uh, more, I guess, um, a more mainstream um, strategy, but also ensure that there are some practical incentives for entrepreneurs that decide to incorporate as such. Um, and then partnering with the business community has been amazing. So we look at corporations, you know, not only as sort of potential funding partners, which which they are, and, and we need them to be such, but we um, we also need their talent. So we we work very closely with with businesses to try to get their employees engaged with our community. And of course, you know, that's certainly a CSR trend that we're that we're seeing. Um, so I, I would just say, like, anyone who wants to get into this work or continue to, you know, sort of grow in this area, it's, I mean, partnerships are everything. Um, and, and I should also say, like, we, you know, we don't operate alone in this sort of capacity as an incubator accelerator. There are a lot of other business um, services providers in the state, and we try to make sure that we know them well, we add value, we don't, you know, there's so much need, so we don't want to duplicate what other groups are doing, but really think of it as a continuum and a spectrum and, and try to be each other's, you know, biggest sort of advocates and um, send clients to each other, et cetera, when it's relevant. Yeah, I mean, I, Kelly, one of the things that you said, um, which I see the trend of as well, and, and Donovan, I'm, I'm wondering if you, you see it, and I'm sure you do, even if in Canada, is that we all are conveners. We all create this participatory platform, this space, um, so that these entrepreneurs, whether they are at the ideation stage or they're undergraduates, or they are what Kelly had identified to me when we talked earlier, like existing businesses who want to transform their business into what we call a more triple bottom line or value-based um, enterprise, and so we create the space so that the people who we can we work with can use the power of their business for some type of social or environmental good. And so I love that that is um, attracting mainstream because we aren't just some crazy people who think that is more than just profit. We can also think about people on the planet as well. But let me ask you guys this question: um, as I indicated before. The model that Food Lab uses as an organizational structure is that we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And so I'm wondering if we can get into the nitty gritties of how our organizations um, are structured. Our legal entity, again, is a 501c3, and our revenue model is of such. You know, we, a large portion of our grants comes from our foundation partners. You indicated, Kelly, how important it is for us to reach out to the business community, and we do. Um, we use them in a couple different ways, in fundraising capacities and also as, as mentors. A large portion, we're, we're a young organization. We're about a year and a half old. Um, and a large portion of our budget comes from the grants um, that we receive from our tremendous foundation partners. 
Because we are a membership-based organization, we do also have a revenue model where our membership pays membership fees. Uh, because we offer um, a suite of services, um, our workshops, um, we charge for those. Um, our How to Build a Better Good Food Business, our workshop series, um, we charge for that as well. So we are slowly but surely trying to build out a revenue model that is very diverse um, because a large portion of our uh, budget comes from um, our foundation friends. And I guess the challenge around that is that I spend a lot of time grant writing and <laughs> fundraising um, as a result of it. So I'm just wondering if Kelly and Donovan, you can speak about the um, organizational structure um, of your organization. Um, well, I'm happy to go first on this one. Um, so we're a nonprofit also. Uh, we are, um, I spend a lot of my time fundraising as, as well and thinking about uh, how I can generate more earned revenue and, and you know, really practice what we preach, right? right, um, right. So we're about 25% uh, funded by individual donors. So many people, many of those 215 uh, volunteers that are in our network are actually our donors as well. And um, that model, I think, is just um, a fantastic one because mm -hmm. they are very engaged. And we just, I, you know, many people enter our network as volunteers. They see firsthand um, the work that we do, and, and you know, they become ongoing uh, supporters of our work. Uh, we're about then, I'd say, 55% um, donations and, and corporate philanthropy, and then uh, about 20% earned revenue. And again, we do charge for our services as well, pretty minimal fees. Um, but I'm constantly thinking about, you know, how how we can uh, generate more revenues. I mean, I'm certainly thinking about we have some uh, for-profit social enterprises that have gone through our programs that are doing very well. Like, should we be making equity investments in some of those? That's a, that's a big question. Um, so uh, it's it's a challenge, and I would say that, you know, it, it has been a challenge from day one. Um, it might be getting a little easier, but, you know, funding for intermediaries is, is not, um, it's, it's a bit of an uphill battle. Uh, I will say one of the reasons that we started adopting a cluster um, focus area is um, we could better align ourselves with some of the corporate foundations. Yeah. So um, health and wellness, you know, all of a sudden Delta Dental, who I had been talking to for several years, and they, you know, were sort of like, well, we like the work that you do, but like social enterprise, I don't know, it's not really like our focus area, but health and wellness, now that resonates with them. Right. So um, that, you know, that is sort of, I, I hope it's too early to tell it's pilot still, but I, I think, I feel like it's getting a bit of traction on the fundraising side. Cool. Donovan? Yeah, it's a really important question. And so in our particular case, we are an initiative of the university, mm -hmm. uh, which, in, and we don't have our own uh, incorporated status as, as RADIUS. And, and that's really a double-edged sword. On the one hand, uh, as a university, we, we essentially have charitable status. Uh, for folks that are looking, you know, to make a, you know, a contribution uh, in exchange for a tax deduction. So, so that is useful. Uh, and, you know, there's obviously, you know, credibility and convening power that comes from the university. Uh, and then there's also a bunch of, you know, the other side of that equation, which is not always as, as fun. <laughs> I probably won't get into the details of that, but, uh, you know, it's just a, an issue of just, you know, being nimble and, uh, and things of that nature. Um, in terms of so our core budget, uh, which is about eight hundred thousand a year now, uh, comes from a, a few different sources. The university is fairly minimal in it, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Um, you know, Van City and uh, and a few other financial institutions uh, are really you know strongly behind what we do. Uh, so in particular, uh, the Royal Bank of Canada, which is uh, actually one of the world's biggest banks now, um, uh, supports our. Uh, First Peoples uh, Enterprise Accelerator Program, which is a program specifically focused on 
uh, cultivating and supporting Aboriginal entrepreneurs. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're really excited to be launching that. Um, the Business Development Bank of Canada, Scotia Bank, you know, like we, we have a bunch of banks that work with us, which again is a little bit tricky because, you know, they all certainly have their, you know, brand enhancement motivation in addition to wanting to generate, you know, pipeline and deal flow. Uh, so we manage that carefully. And, and so the other piece of our core uh, uh, income uh, revenue stream uh, is to a certain extent from the ventures themselves. So our accelerator program, uh, we don't charge a fee. Uh, you know, our costs are underwritten by our financial partners, uh, but we do take a performance fee uh, as they grow. You know, so essentially, we invest uh, time and energy and talent and space and all that sort of stuff in each of these ventures. Uh, and as they grow, then we take a percentage of their revenue. Um, and so, and that's up to uh, essentially two times our program delivery cost, uh, and that could be. Uh, in the form of cash, or if they're not in a position to cash out, uh, then we will take you know take that in the form of uh, you know convertible note or equity. And so, and we we have done all of those so far, and it's and it's working. I mean, and it allows us to make sure that we've got some in the game. And you know, the fact that our second cohort, you know, within four months of uh, finishing our program, uh, had as a whole increased their revenue by fifty percent already. Um, is A, just a great indicator of, you know, impact and financial success. B, each of them is delivering a, a very, very strong, high impact product or service out in the world. Uh, and, and three, it, you know, it allows us to, uh, you know, to, to participate in that to, uh, to a certain degree. So that really aligns. And, and so, um, you know, as we're successful, you know, the percentage of our budget that we'll get recouped from the success of our ventures uh, will hopefully increase. Let, let me let me expand on what you just said. Um, and one of the things that Radius Ventures um, says um, quite often, and that is, we um, create, or the folks that are part of Radius create radical ideas that are useful to society. Right? They're making an impact in the world. So I think that myself, you, Kelly, we would all agree that our work. And the work that our entrepreneurs are doing, that our businesses um, are doing, that are part of our organization, that we realize that we are doing movement building work um, that is changing the landscape of business simply by defining that we are purposeful, that we want to create impact rather than only just looking at profit. And I was wondering, Donovan, if you could talk a little bit about what are the key objectives that uh, Radius is aiming for? What are some of the key problems that you all are trying to solve? And what programs do you offer to solve those problems? I guess that for our listening audience and people who will be looking at this webinar, it's about starting with the why. Why are you doing this work? And how is that being impactful into the greater, larger society? Yeah, that, that is really the fundamental uh, issue. And so when it comes to, um, you know, the why, and we're not terribly prescriptive in terms of, you know, we will only work with, you know, um, you know, circular economy focused companies as radius, end of story. Um, you know, our current cohort is focused on local food companies. And, and so that, you know, that's our first time taking a sectoral approach uh, to our, uh, you know, to, to um, uh, with the cohorts, you know, because they're the issue is, you know, each one of these individual ventures is solving a major problem and helping to decorporatize the piece of the economy, and, and, and that's really important. But the cumulative impact of us working, you know, as a cohort of seven ventures uh, allows us to have a bit more of a systemic change and to start to look at, you know, access to commercial kitchens and co-packing, you know, some of the abstract you know, business model conversations. You can really get down into the into the nuts and bolts when they're all food companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I okay. And I was just gonna say, but in terms of you know, so most of what we do at, at Radius is you know is is aligning you know when people come and they make their applications, you know, here is a meaningful and important problem, uh, and then here I as an entrepreneur have my proposed solution to it, and if it seems like you know that is a good, that's a meaningful important problem, potentially a viable solution. Uh, will support you on your way. But what we're also wanting to do now is, is take a step earlier in that chain and say, well, here are just some really sticky, wicked problems uh, that we don't yet have a solution for. And so in that context, we're actually launching uh, in partnership with the XPRIZE Foundation a, an incentive challenge 
to solve, uh, you know, in this case, we're, we're focusing on uh, grocery, uh, food waste coming out of grocery stores. Okay. And, you know, so it's a, you know, we're working with a grocery partner and it's an open call to anybody that can reduce their food waste expense by this amount over six months will win this prize. Wow. And, and so we don't know what the solution is. You know, is it, mm. is it marketing? Is it, you know, logistics and supply chain? Is it new product development? Is it all of the above? You know, again, that's why we're just putting it out there and just saying, hey, you know, world, you know, tell us what the solution is. And if you do it, then, uh, then we all win. Yeah. Um, Kelly, I know you had dropped, Kelly, you had dropped off for a second. The question uh, that Donovan and I were talk tackling was the why, um, because mm -hmm. we understand that we are a part of a larger movement. And I guess here um, in Detroit, our, <laughs> our, our perils, our, our challenges have been uh, duly noted to the world. We were the largest city uh, to file for, for bankruptcy. And there are a lot of challenges in the city of Detroit um, that Food Lab Detroit um, looks at. But more importantly, Kelly, you mentioned that how important it is to be aligned. And that's how we uh, attract funders, because there are a couple of things that we recognize that are challenges in Detroit that we look at. Number one is this access to healthy food in traditionally underserved and marginalized communities. Now, I think a lot of folks know that um, by the terminology of food deserts um, that are located in some of our urban cities. And so we work with entrepreneurs to address that challenge. Um, what is also um, the availability of quality jobs or jobs, period, um, in the city of Detroit, and then this whole notion of economic development done in a way that is equitable and also fair. So all of our programming, we try to address, like, how can we create strong, sustainable food businesses? And we're really focused because we're industry-specific um, in neighborhoods. And so we work with the city. Um, right now, the city of Detroit has a program that is called Motor City Match, where they are trying to pair entrepreneurs with um, landlords um, who actually own business. How can we pair the businesses with the landlords to rehab the building so we can create um, a great restaurant? or a healthy food bodega, or some type of activity along some of these neighborhoods to create the, what I would say, the conditions and set the, the stage to attract additional investment in those communities. We also are, are helping our um, entrepreneurs. We partner with another organization that is called the Detroit Food Academy, which is a um, nonprofit organization that works with our youth. How are we partnering with them to get our youth excited about working in the local food economy and pairing them up with the Food Lab member to serve as mentors um, so that when our youth are ready to look for a job, they have already established some type of working relationship with the business owner, and then they're hiring them. And then last but not least, this whole notion of like economic development, the impact that it makes when a coffee shop or a restaurant or um, a grocery store is located in a neighborhood has just been impactful and tremendous. So all of those kind of issues, um, you know, we're trying to tackle here, here in Detroit. So Kelly, I was just wondering, like, what is your why? What is the why behind SG Greenhouse and some issues that you all are tackling up there in Rhode Island? Right. Um, so, well, I actually moved um, from uh, Michigan to Rhode yep. Island seven years ago from the two, you know, from the state with the highest unemployment or the second highest to the state with the highest or the second highest. They were um, direct competitors in that area for a while. So, uh, for us, it's job creation, and it's it's good job creation, mm -hmm. and it's job creation for all. So um, I would say definitely more than a quarter of our businesses are workforce development models where um, their focus is to create training and job opportunities for uh, marginalized populations. Um, you know, the, the other thing about Rhode Island is it's a, it's a majority minority place and, and there is, there it's just, you know, it's like this amazing, um, snapshot of income inequality that mm. have and have not. And we're really, you know, we are, our businesses are um, solving the challenges that, or trying to solve the challenges that they have not faced. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really think of us as, 
you know, an economic development organization, but an equitable economic development organization. Um, I have, uh, boy, I've struggled over the past seven years to get the, to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were sort of always like the little do-gooder cousin of the high-tech incubator, et cetera. Um, and it was a huge win when a month or two ago, the economic development report for the city of Providence came out and it said that social enterprise was a, you know, a high impact growth sector. So it is being seen now as an economic development driver and um, viewed as, you know, as a way to solve some of the state's most pressing problems. So that's, I mean, that's what we do and, and why we're, you know, why we all come to work and love it every day. Exactly. And, and you know, um, Kelly, I, I think that a lot of the things that, you know, Food Lab is working on along with SE Greenhouse is very symbiotic. Um, and even though you're in Rhode Island, I know you're a Michigan girl and Michigan is home, there are so many similarities. Um, not only is there the similarities with the income equality, particularly here in the city of Detroit, but this, this whole um, reality of the segregation that happens between Detroit and the Detroit metropolitan area. And what that looks like when it when it breaks out um, amongst race, and also the extraction of resources that leave the city of Detroit and are then deployed out into the suburban communities. And so tackling that is all about food lab building community. I mean, we have members that are part of the food lab community that would have quite honestly, never would have met. They don't live next to each other. Their kids don't go to the same school. They don't have any interaction. A lot of that is due to the fact that Detroit has a very poor public transportation system. So they wouldn't even interact on a subway or a train or a bus. They would have never met um, and have interacted if it were not for Food Lab Detroit. So we try very, very hard uh, to build community amongst what we call unlikely bedfellows. And that crosses all kinds of lines, black, white, um, rich, poor, generational Detroiters, newcomers into the area, because building community is so very, very important to the work that I think we all are doing. So when we talk about this creating community, can you guys talk a little bit about um, how the services that you are providing to your community how you are creating that in a way that I know, Kelly, for you, that is very blended. Some of the services that we provide um, are pr primarily like one-to-one. -one. Food Lab is very high touch. All of the services that we provide are kind of like face-to-face. -face. And so, Donovan, I know you were talking about some of the great events that you do. Um, Kelly, I know you have online learning, a very robust curriculum. So talk about how to build cre uh, community through the programming that you do, either online or face-to-face. -face. Donovan? Yeah, I mean, that is really an essential question. And, you know, because it's, in many respects, you know, we are doing our best to pull new people into the thriving social impact, social venture community in Vancouver and and uh, and this part of the world. And so that, that puts us in a very, you know, in a position of having a, really wanting to be very conscious about who we're making sure, you know, feels welcome and, mm -hmm. and feel like, you know, sees the hand and, and, and feels the pull in, in a positive way. Um, and so, you know, because like, you know, Vancouver, you know, the, the social impact community here, broadly speaking, if we look around it, I mean, it definitely skews, you know, white uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and middle class and, and you know, and, and middle aged to a degree. And so, we have a tremendous opportunity working with the university, uh, which doesn't, uh, and you know, and we're in a community, we're in a city which is 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 now or is is about to be uh, majority majority minority. You know, we have very very uh, significant uh, East Asian and South Asian populations, uh, and then this entire community is on uh, unceded uh, Aboriginal lands. You know, we're the only part of the uh, of the country. That has never had, through process of treaty or war, um, uh, had you know the legal right of uh, First Nations people uh, mm -hmm. been extinguished. You know, and so that that creates all sorts of, of, of legal, but more importantly, moral and cultural questions around how we're going to create that space uh, and make sure that that you know everybody sees that you know radius as a conduit into the social venture community 
uh, is available to everybody. And you know, we'll, we'll continue to make mistakes, and we'll continue to uh, you know to have some minor successes, but you know, it's always top of mind. Mm -hmm. Kelly, creating community. Um, well, yeah, community is at the center of it all. Um, so I agree with what you said earlier, Davida, about really what we're doing in a lot of ways are, is movement building. Um, and, and I think that I'm feeling that more and more. Um, similar to Donovan, um, Davida, you and I have talked about this. We have struggled a bit with um, diversity within our community also. I think generally if you look at impact entrepreneurship, um, I won't say globally, let's say in North America, um, it does skew probably very uh, privileged, right? Um, because it's to start a business, any business, you need resources and you need the Absolutely. networks and you and um, so so we are really actively thinking about this. We have a, um, a position that we developed uh, four or five months ago focused on diversity. Um, we had um, done early stage business technical assistance um, with a focus on um, some of, I would say, the more marginalized communities several years ago. It was really tough um, because we weren't on the ground there. It took a while to build trust and credibility, even though we were working with community partners. So one of our strategies now that we're dabbling with, which I'm really excited about, is we are working much more closely with um, agencies that are serving um, some communities uh, that w were uh, less tapped into, um, and we're trying to support those organizations um, to develop entrepreneurship programs of their own so that they can work with um, their communities early stage and, and then hopefully, you know, really tap, uh, that can become a pipeline development for some of our programs. Um, as far as, you know, another um, piece of our community building that I just want to mention, um, we opened our co-working space in April, and that has just been, I had no idea what that would do for um, the development of our community. Uh, we were working out of a pretty small office and begging, borrowing, stealing space to hold our public events up until then. And um, this space has just resulted in so many amazing collisions. Um, we have, you know, sort of added 79 new ventures slash entrepreneurs to our community since we've opened the space. We have, um, you know, 60 businesses that are actually physically working out of the space now. Um, we are, you know, we're ready to expand. Um, we're, we're in a building that Brown University owns, and we're trying to talk them into giving us the, the space next door to us so we can double our capacity. But that, um, wow. you know, affinity groups have developed, like uh, one of our entrepreneurs um, uses wrestling as a method for youth empowerment. He's amazing, and he was like, I think there are a lot of organizations that are using sports as as Absolutely. an empowerment tool, and he's like, I'm just going to have like a little networking event. Fifteen new organizations showed up, and now he does those events monthly. So in a way, even though we sort of are the anchor tenant, I would say, of the co-working space, it really is like for the community, by the community. All of our ventures now have a place where they can have big public events, so there's just like something going on all the time in this space. So it has I, been a game changer. You know, and that's it's exactly where um, I was going to go. So thank you, Kelly, and for folks who are hard, who will be looking at this. You know, as I indicated, Food Lab we um, are about a year and a half old, and right now, just some real practical challenges that we face, um, especially in doing our programming, is that I mean, it's it's, it's a double-edged sword. Is that because we work out of a very small co-working space, um, when we have to do our programming, which is done mostly in the evening time. We have to do them in community. So we're constantly reaching out to partners um, in different parts of Detroit. Detroit's 140 square miles, and we partner a lot with community development corporations. Even we partner with churches. We partner with community centers where we hold our programming.
And that gives us and our members the opportunity to travel all around the city of Detroit to do our programming for folks to get to know us, for us to get to know them. But it's kind of difficult because we don't have our own facility. We don't have our own space. So we're very limited to what we can do and when we can do it because of that limitation. So I, I love the fact that I look forward to the fact of the day that Food Lab can have a home. So being out in the community has been tremendous for us. We don't have any marketing budget. We're super small. A lot of the ways that people find out about Food Lab is through our members, right, through word of mouth. And a lot of the ways in which we engage our members, because we are very, very intentional about diversity, is that sometimes we have phone drive campaigns. We've got to call our members. Um, we send text messages. We even have flyers. So, you know, we have to meet people where they are, and we want to be welcoming to um, all folks. So, yeah, I look forward to the day in which we have our own kind of facility. I think that's definitely going to be a game changer. Jonathan, are there any logistics um, things that have been challenging or rewarding for, for, for Radius. Um, you guys have your own space, don't you? We do, yeah. We're, we're part of a, a, a co-location space for impact organizations now, and we'll be moving into uh, yeah, into our own building a, a couple blocks away uh, wow. in September of next year, which we're excited yeah. about. I mean, it, it's an interesting challenge of, of providing the right space, and there's a huge need for space, but it, but it also has to be the, the right type of space. So, mm. you know, Vancouver, Vancouver was recently rated the, the world's second most unaffordable city, uh, oh. like the world's, not, not Canada's. Um, and, you yeah. know, and so there's, absolutely so that's, you know, that's, you know, affordability relative to the to incomes of the people that live here, uh, because there's a lot of global forces that are, you know, affecting our real estate markets, you know, parking absolutely. money rather than just, not just people that are looking for a place to sleep that are uh, that are buying houses here and holding on to them, uh, and so that makes it really difficult for entrepreneurs and you know young folks that you know as, as Kelly said you know don't have you know that monthly income because they're taking a chance to try and do something cool. Um, it's it's a really difficult space to do that, and so providing some space is really key. Um, but in terms of if we, if we look at the ventures that we work with, you know, many of which are food ventures or many of which are makers or many of which are, you know, things of this nature, you know, the space they need is, is you know, co-packing facilities or, or, you know, commercial kitchens or, or, you know, cold storage or maker space. And so getting all of that under one roof is, is difficult for us. So we've actually... Mm -hmm. We we do have a co-working space that we're a part of, and we we you know we've got a bunch of desks that uh, we provide to entrepreneurs. Uh, but as of this last cohort, we've actually decoupled it from our cohorts, you know, because yeah. there are those that are looking for for desk space, and there are those that are looking to be in our cohorts. Uh, and in some cases, those are the same people, and, and in many cases, they're not. And okay. so uh, we actually, yeah, we have a, a broader community when it comes to uh, who uses our space. And so we have about five minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to Andrew uh, from Bali for closing. But in the last uh, the five minutes we have together, and this conversation has really been phenomenal. Thank you so much, Donovan and Kelly. And in our my, my last question um, is, you know, we've been at this uh, for a while. Um, Kelly, you being the longest, seven years. And so I'm going to let you uh, tackle this, and, and Donovan and I are going to jump in. But what do you wish you knew, Kelly, um, at the very beginning of your journey? What do I wish I knew? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, so many things. Well, I love I I I, I really love the uh, the failure work that Donovan <laughs> does because I mean we have had so many um, pivots and failures and um, program you know services that we've uh, eliminated, relaunched, etc. Um, so hmm. I think um, I think what I'm most excited about right now is uh, the the cluster focus areas. Um, so I wish actually we kind of would have started with that because mm. what we're seeing by focusing a bit and and I would always want to be totally inclusive at, at the same time, which is my flaw. I want to sort of always include everyone and do everything, um, which is probably sort of an entrepreneurial trait, like you just see the opportunity all the time. But um, through the cluster focus work, I think we um, 
and Donovan alluded to this, we've been able to sort of look more holistically across an industry and say, hey, you know, it would be really cool if there was, like, no one's providing dental care to um, low-income communities in an affordable, accessible way. Like, someone needs to figure out how to do that. Oh, and by the way, Delta Dental will fund that. Oh, and by the way, mm. there's a really cool model in Detroit that could easily be replicated. Um, so I think by having these focus areas, um, we can play a more active role in, in really strategic pipeline development. Um, our pipeline is improving, but I think you can talk to anyone working with social entrepreneurs, you know, pipeline is an issue. Like we, you know, we, we want more really viable um, impact businesses coming into um, our network. Uh, so that and um, oh, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah I, you know, we've got a couple minutes, and, I, and yeah. I'll, 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 I'll jump in with with, yeah. with some of the things that I've learned just being almost two years old, and and that is is number one. We've had a, a couple of uh, staff transitions, and so I've got to tell you. When thinking about um, doing the work that we're doing, you know, we are very intentional on building our community, right? But we need to use that same type of intentionality when building our staff. Like, that is so important for us because we are a very place-based um, organization that we really want people to come in and understand uh, the context uh, of the city of Detroit, that in which we do our work. Um, and, and that's just that's just extremely important. We want that same kind of passion that our leadership team has. We want that to flow throughout our entire organization, but we have to equip them with the tools that, that they need in order to get the results that, that, that we want. So really being very clear about who we are, who we service, what our mission is, not only to our members, but also to our staff as well. And, and then the last thing, I guess, for me in terms of staff and human resources and learning, like, it's like we're trying to build a culture that we know that we cannot change the world overnight. So this whole, I'm going to work longer hours than you, or I've got more on my plate than you do, or I'm exhausted because I like, no, stop it. Like, we all need to be taking care of ourselves. We as staff members, we need to be healthy, too. So take some time out. It is okay. Take a break. We want dedicated people, but we don't want exhausted individuals. So to build this culture of health um, around our staff um, is very important. And then lastly, in order to do all of that, one of the things that I've learned is I have to learn, and our staff has to learn, when to say no. Because we are so small and we are so eager, we tend to say yes a lot when we don't have the capacity um, to do that, and we end up working ourselves um, a lot in order to fulfill on the promise. Uh, so yeah, we're just being very mindful about um, how we're growing and how we're growing in a very intentional way. Um, yeah, and that means not jumping at every opportunity um, that comes your way. Sometimes you just got to say, nope, can't do that. Maybe when we're a little bit larger, maybe we can, but right now we can't. Donovan? Yeah, I mean, I would mostly just echo uh, a, a lot of that. I mean, I, I don't know if there's sort of, I guess there's definitely lessons in them, you know, but, uh, you know, the, the key challenges are really about recruiting and, mm. you know, making sure that we get the right people in the room, you know, because similarly, I mean, we're trying to create an ecosystem or build an ecosystem, be inclusive and open, but in order for us to be valuable, we have to be really, really clear and focused on what our value is. Uh, and who it's a value for. And so uh, I, I think really doing more work up front on that and, and really understanding, um, you know, how to structure programs that are attractive to those people. Uh, you know, in, in many cases it comes from, you know, you know where you can, you know, how big an area you, you can pull from. And, uh, you know, we're, Vancouver itself is a city of two million people, but, you know, between you know, there's Seattle and, and Portland are close by, but, you know, there's not another uh, urban center in Canada for, you know, a 14-hour drive. And so, you know, in order for us to offer uh, a program that people will travel from Toronto or Calgary or someplace else to, to come to, um, that has to be funded differently, that has to be structured differently. And so that's a conversation we're now having, you know, three, four cycles in. Um, and, you know, 
whether that's a mistake we made or whether it's an evolution we've gotten to. Who knows, but that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Andrew, but first and foremost, I really want to thank um, you, Donovan, um, and all of the work that you're doing in Vancouver. And Kelly, thank you so very much um, for all the great work that you're doing um, in Rhode Island. I can't speak for Donovan, but I will make a commitment right now on tape that I will be there um, if you can see at Sea Summit. Um, I, I cannot wait because the great thing about being a part of the Bali Network is that I think we all know that we are not alone in this work. And we um, want to be able to provide the tools and the resources so that we can bring more people um, in the fold and make this so much more of a movement that's bigger than just the, the two of us. So with that being said, thank you guys so much. Um, thank Bali, and I want to turn it over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Davida, and many thanks to all three of you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. That was a wonderful conversation that will definitely be helpful to those looking to catalyze localist action in their places. For more information on this and other local economy ecosystem models, be sure to visit the Bali 101 Toolkit at the Bali website, www.dialocalist.org. And have a great day, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much.